Well, indeed, how marvelous and how wonderful is the love of our Lord, and what a delight it is to hear and see our kids uh, singing along uh, with the adults as the generations uh, all use their gifts to give praise to the glory of God. What a blessing. It is just such a, a wonderful thing to see the next generation learning to love the one who gave them life and the one who loved them so much that he died on the cross for them. So what a blessing we have to come and worship today. One of the themes today is going to be worship. We're going to be in John chapter 4, verses 1 through 26. If you want to begin turning in your Bibles there, as you turn to John chapter 4, uh, beginning with verse 1, I want to remind you that we, we live in a time in which there's a lot of false dichotomies being pushed on Christians by our secular culture and even by some of the religious milieu that is current in our country. I think one of the primary false dilemmas or false dichotomies that we face is this. We're told that we must choose between love and truth, that somehow love and truth are antithetical to one another, and so everyone has to choose to either be loving or to honor the truth of Scripture. So we're told, for example, that a loving person would never call sin, sin, would never confront sin or error, would never warn people about the judgment to come or God's wrath. But it's not loving to watch people heading down a path of destruction and to fail to warn them, to fail to clearly tell them what God has said in his word and that there is a judgment to come. On the other hand, there's people who say, well, if we're going to uphold truth, we need to absolutely shun sinners and refuse to have anything to do with them. And, and if we engage with them at all, it should be basically to mock them or to castigate them. So we have in our day, just as in all other days, because there's nothing new under the sun, a false dichotomy in which we're pressed between the antinomians on the one side and the legalists on the other. We're being constantly pressured by those who think that moral relativism is love and by those who think that religious separatism is truth. I want to put this dilemma in the terms that were current in Jesus' day. In Jesus' day, there were two major parties or, or groupings amongst the Jews of Jesus' day. One was the party of the Sadducees, and the other was the party of the Pharisees. The Sadducees, in general, advocated conforming to the pagan culture, conforming to them. The Pharisees, on the other hand, advocated shunning the pagan culture completely. And so you had this incredible dichotomy between those who say you have to conform to the culture and those who say that we should shun the culture. And we're still pulled between those two ancient errors today. Both of them are spiritually destructive, neither is biblical, and neither is in accordance with the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord commanded us to be in the world, contra to the Pharisees, but not of the world, contra to the Sadducees. We are to be in the world, but not of the world. In other words, we're neither to shun the world nor to be conformed to it. Rather, we are to speak the truth in love. We are to be ambassadors of God's kingdom, living in close relationship to the unbelieving world, but speaking the truth to them out of God's love and our love for them. We see this in Jesus' own example. He was known as a friend of sinners. He built relationships with them. He spent time with them. He extended hospitality to them and accepted hospitality from them. He genuinely cared for them. Yet he never participated in their sin. He never condoned their sin. He never enabled their sin. He never failed to confront their sin. And he never failed to call sinners to repentance. He spoke the truth in love. A true friend of sinners. Not a fake friend who tells them what they want to hear, but a true friend who, tell them, who told them what they needed to hear. Our goal as believers must be to be conformed to the likeness of Christ, to follow his example in speaking the truth in love. I think today in John 4, 1 through 26, 
we're going to see Jesus' perfect example of this. Jesus is going to be initiating a conversation with a social outcast, an immoral woman who has a ton of sin in her life, and Jesus is going to respectfully and lovingly confront her sin and extend to her the grace of God. He's going to speak lovingly, respectfully, but he's also going to expose and correct both her sin and her false doctrine. There's a lot to glean in this passage, so what we're going to do is we're going to actually kind of survey it twice. The first time through, we're going to see seven doctrinal truths that are taught to us by Jesus, the great theologian. Jesus is the greatest theologian because no one knows God better than God. So we're going to learn seven doctrinal truths from the great theologian, and then we're going to take a look at Jesus' ministry methods. We're going to learn seven lessons on witnessing, on personal witnessing, from Jesus Christ, the great evangelist. So let's look first at the theology, seven key doctrinal truths taught by Jesus, the great theologian. The first is in chapter 4, verses 1 through 2, where we see that Jesus was making and baptizing disciples making and baptizing disciples. And the first thing we learn is we learn from verse 2. It says Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were. And we talked about this last week, that Jesus works through his body, the church, to make and then baptize disciples. Chapter 3, verse 22, and then chapter 4, verse 1, both say that Jesus was making and baptizing disciples. And then verse 2 of chapter 4 says that he was doing that through his disciples. They were the ones physically baptizing, but Jesus was the one working through them. The church is his body, his hands and his feet. He works through us to do his will and his work in the world. This should remind us of the importance of the local church, why we don't believe in lone wolf Christians, just out there with your own private relationship with Christ. We we know that Scripture teaches a personal relationship with Jesus, but not a private relationship with Jesus. We have a corporate body, and we are all members of that body. And the Lord uses the church to do his work of making and baptizing disciples. The second uh, lesson, theological lesson, that we learn from Jesus in this passage is in verses 3 through 8. We read that he comes, and he comes to the well, and he is tired. He is tired. I want to pick up the account in verse 4 and then read through verse 26. It says that Jesus had to pass through Samaria. Verse 5, so he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, since I am a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. She said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? You're not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, Give me this water so that I will not be thirsty nor come all the way here to draw. He said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have correctly said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, 
Believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he was called Christ. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us. Jesus said to her, I, who speak to you, am he. So in this account, we're seeing these seven great lessons of theology. First, that Jesus works through his body, the church, to make and baptize disciples. And secondly, verses 3 through 8 teach us that Jesus experienced human weaknesses such as weariness and thirst because he was fully man. Right? He comes on this long journey on those dusty roads with the stony ground that is so ubiquitous in the land of Israel. And he's weary and tired and thirsty. And he comes to this well and asks the Samaritan woman for a drink. He experienced weariness, thirst, heat, exhaustion, every form of human weakness and frailty. You know, sometimes I... I think we're kind of influenced by some of the Middle Ages and Renaissance paintings and portrayals of Christ, and we tend to think of him as if he spent his life floating above the ground rather than getting blisters while walking on it. He was truly man, and he experienced each and every form of human weakness. In fact, every hard thing that you've faced in life, he has faced. And this means that he can empathize with you. He understands you. He understands how hard this life in this fallen world is because he literally walked our land in our shoes. He had a hard labor job as a carpenter in Nazareth. God is not just some distant being in heaven who can't relate to you, who doesn't understand what it's like to fall into bed bone-tired after a hard days of work. He experienced the hardships of this life. Fully man. The book of Hebrews says that we have a high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses because he was tempted in all things as we are, yet never sinned. It says that he had to be made like his brethren in all respects. It says that because the children are of flesh and blood, he himself partook of the same of flesh and blood so that he could become a merciful and faithful high priest in the things pertaining to God to make propitiation for sin. He was made like us in all respects, weary, tired, thirsty, As a carpenter, I'm sure he had contracts that didn't pay and projects that didn't go well. We tend to think of him as just kind of lounging and kind of snapping his fingers to make those projects that he as a carpenter was doing. It's not the case. He didn't float above the ground. He walked on it. He experienced the splinters, the blisters, the thumb hit with the hammer, all of the hardships of life. Jesus was fully man. As a man, he experienced all the trials and temptations of the human condition, but yet without sin, perfect. So we can draw near to his throne of grace. We can come to him with confidence, knowing he understands us. He understands our weaknesses, our frailties, our suffering. He understands our temptations. He knows these things, not just through divine omniscience, but through personal experience. The one who is currently seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven is the same one who once sat exhausted and thirsty in the heat of the day at a well in Samaria. He is fully man. A third 
doctrinal lesson that we can learn from this passage is that Jesus is the source of living water, which springs up to eternal life, verses 9 through 14. If verses 3 through 8 reminded us that Jesus is fully man, verses 9 through 14 should remind us that he is fully God. Why do I say that? Because this is a reference to Jeremiah chapter 2, verses 11 through 13, in which God says, Has a nation changed gods when they were not gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Shudder, be very desolate, declares the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, to hew for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. God, speaking through the prophet Jeremiah, says, I am the fountain of living waters. The sacred name of God is used in that passage. And now Jesus, in John chapter 4, says that he is the fountain of living waters, that he gives living waters to those who ask of him. It's a very clear claim of deity, of oneness with God the Father. Now, why does he use living waters as the analogy of eternal life? Israel, if you've ever been there, is a pretty dry place. Rocky, dry ground is in most of the country. So for the people of that day, water was life. You had water, you had life. You ran out of water, you died. And so water was the perfect symbol for salvation, the perfect symbol for eternal life. And Jesus says, I'm going to give you living water, water that springs up and gives you eternal life, water which if you drink of it, you never thirst again for all of eternity. I want to point out to you three key truths that Jesus teaches about this living water, this eternal life. First, in chapter 10, in verse 10, at the beginning of the verse, he says that living water is a gift of God. He says, if you knew the gift of of God and who it is who says to you give me a drink you would have asked him and he would have given you living water living water is a gift of God not earned not merited not obtained through religious ceremonies or merits but a gift which God gives by grace it is a gift of God secondly at the end of verse 10 we see how we obtain this gift how we receive this gift We obtain it by asking Jesus for it. He says, if you knew who was talking to you, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. You receive the living water by asking Jesus for it. Third, look down at verse 14. We see that if you drink this living water once, you never thirst again through all of eternity. If you drink it once, Jesus says, whoever drinks of the water that I will give to him shall never thirst, but the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. And when Jesus says, whoever drinks the water I give him, he uses a verb tense called the aorist, which speaks of a finished or completed action. This isn't a process of of kind of drinking a little bit of the living water and getting a little more and kind of getting closer to salvation, a little more grace, a little more salvation until you finally reach some zenith of salvation and earn your way to heaven. No, he's saying that this is an action that once you drink of it once, you never thirst again through all of eternity. He's speaking of that decisive moment of salvation when a person is born again, their sins are forgiven, they're indwelled by the Holy Spirit, they're justified before God, eternally secure in Him. Yes, God may use a multifaceted, multi-step, multi-year process to get you to the source of living water. But when that moment comes, when by saving faith, you drink of Christ, you drink of that living water that He gives, From that moment on, through all of eternity, you will never thirst again. So let me ask you, have you partaken of the living water? Has there been that decisive moment when by faith you received Christ, when you asked him for the living water and he gave it to you? 
If not, listen to God's invitation from Isaiah 55.1. He goes, hey, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. Come to the waters. He invites you to come to drink and to never thirst again. Salvation is a gift freely offered to you. You receive it by asking Jesus for it. There's a fourth theological truth in verses 15 through 19, which is that Jesus exercised divine attributes. The example here is the attribute of omniscience. And he did so because he was fully God. Can you imagine how stunned the Samaritan woman had to have been? I mean, here she just comes. It's a regular day. She's doing a regular part of her regular day. And she meets a stranger there that she's not expecting to see there. He's a Jew. She's not expecting to see a Jew in Samaria. Then he talks to her. She's not expecting that. Then he asks for a drink. She's not expecting that. Then he starts telling her he can give her living water. She's not expecting that. And then... He reveals that he knows her past and her present secrets. I know you've had five husbands. The one you have right now isn't your husband. John chapter 2, verse 25 says, Jesus did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what is in man. It says in chapter 2 that he knew what was in all men. This is the attribute of omniscience. Christ, during his incarnation, exercised his divine attributes according to the will of the Father. And we see him here exercising the divine attribute of omniscience. How do we know that Jesus is God? Because he manifests and has the attributes of deity, one of which is omniscience. It is not a mere man who knows the past and the present of people he had never met before. That is a divine attribute. And what is the application for us? It's this. Since Jesus knows everything you've ever done and everything you're doing now, trying to hide your sin from him is a fool's errand. It is pointless. He already knows it, so you might as well confess it to him, repent, and turn from it. A fifth theological lesson is this. Jesus replaced the temple as the center of true worship. We see in verses 20 through 21 that she asked him about this kind of age-old debate between the Samaritans and the Jews, whether Mount Gerizim was the right place of worship or Jerusalem was. Jesus says this dispute is about to become irrelevant Not on this mountain, nor in Jerusalem is where people are going to worship because now people are going to worship in spirit and truth. Why? Because the incarnate Son of God, the living temple, was there. He had come. The Shekinah glory of God in human flesh, revealed on the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus now is the center of worship. Not a place, but a person. Jesus as God incarnate superseded both the temple and Mount Gerizim, which according to Deuteronomy 11.29 was the place where the blessings of God had been proclaimed. Jesus superseded them both. Worship now is about a person, not a place. That's why we don't have to turn a certain direction or turn towards a certain place or be in a certain place in order to pray, in order to worship. We worship Christ. The Lord wanted to make sure no one missed this point. A few decades later in 70 AD, the temple would be destroyed and the worship on Mount Gerizim would be ended through the brutal actions of the Romans. There's no longer any temple, no longer a center of worship on Mount Gerizim a reminder that all of those things have passed with the old covenant. Jesus has now come. Worship is now centered around a person, not a place. Sixth, Jesus defined true worship. By the way, who gets to define true worship? God alone. Jesus here defines true worship as worship which is in spirit and truth. He says, God is spirit, so the only true worship is worship that is in spirit and truth. 
What does it mean to worship in spirit and truth? Notice in your Bibles that the word spirit appears with a small s. That's because this is referring not to the Holy Spirit, but to the human spirit. God is spirit, so you must worship him from your spirit, with your spirit. What does it mean to be a true worshiper? It means you must worship in spirit, not merely externally, but internally. From the deepest part of you, the heart of your heart, your soul, your spirit, your innermost being. In other words, true worship must be sincere and genuine worship which flows from the heart, which is not a show for people, but a genuine expression of worship and praise given to God from the heart. All of you responding to all of him. Notice worship must also be in truth. This reminds us that the content of of our worship must conform to the truth that God has revealed in his word or else it is not worship. You could have the greatest song that stirs up the deepest emotions and if it does not conform, if the content does not conform to the truth of God's word, it isn't worship. I don't care how emotional it makes you. I don't care how much it stirs you. If it is not accurate to the word of God, it is not worship. Worship must be, no, must be in spirit and truth. That, by the way, is why our philosophy of worship here at Calvary Bible Church carefully tries to avoid both emotionalism and rationalism. Emotionalism says that music and lighting should be used to whip the crowd into an emotional frenzy because the more people, the the assumption is, right, that the more people cry, dance, sway, the more they're really worshiping. In other words, the level of your emotion is the level of worship. That's emotionalism. There's an opposite error, though, which is rationalism. Rationalism says, no, worship should be merely cerebral, cognitive. The idea is that worship should make us motionless and emotionless. Emotionalism and rationalism, both are errors. One is wrong because it isn't worship in spirit, and the other is wrong because it isn't worship in truth. Jesus said we must worship. God is searching for true worshipers. He's saying it is difficult for him to find true worshipers. There's so much emotionalism and rationalism that God is searching, seeking for hearts that will worship in spirit and in truth. So what should the goal of our worship service be? What should our individual goal be when we come to worship? It should be wholehearted biblical worship. To worship in spirit and truth means that all of me, my mind, my will, and my emotions should be responding in praise, magnifying my Lord and Savior. All of me responding to all of Him. A seventh theological lesson is that Jesus clearly said he is the Messiah. The woman said to him, verse 25, I know that Messiah is coming. He was called Christ. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. You can't get any clearer statement than that, that Jesus is the Messiah. Now, Jesus was most likely speaking to the woman in Aramaic as being a member of the region of Galilee. He certainly knew Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Here, the inspired Greek translation of what was likely Jesus' Aramaic words uses some striking terms. The Holy Spirit inspires John to record the words ego imi. Why is this so significant? In Greek, you can say in the verb to be that it's the first person singular, that I am, right, just by adding an ending. I, it's very similar when we learned Russian. Uh, Russian is very similar grammatically to Greek, and I, you would rapidly notice you'd almost never hear anyone actually use the pronoun I because the verb itself contains that idea. And so no one would ever say, like, I run in two separate words, the pronoun and the verb. They just say the verb because the verb itself says I run. 
Likewise, in Greek, the first person singular verb to be, a me, means I am. But here, Jesus adds the pronoun ego, I. And he says, ego a me, I, I am. I, myself, I am. And this is significant. Why? Because this is how the Greek translation of the Old Testament translated God's sacred name when he revealed it to Moses at the burning bush. If you read the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament in Exodus, where God is speaking to Moses, Moses says, who are you? Who should I say sent me? And God says, ego in me, I, I am. So here, Jesus not only answers her question clearly by saying that he is indeed that one who is to come, the Messiah, the Christ, but he alludes to the fact that he is one in essence with God the Father by using this phrase, which was used of the sacred name of God. This is, by the way, the first of 23 times Jesus says ego in me in the Gospel of John. Seven of those are what are called the I am statements, where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, or I am the bread of life, or I am the resurrection and the life. Powerful statements of his deity. And the Apostle John highlights those seven statements as part of his purpose to demonstrate that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Remember, he gives seven signs, seven witnesses, and then seven powerful I am statements from Jesus that he is indeed the Son of God. Well, those are seven key doctrinal truths from Jesus, the great theologian. With our remaining time now, I want to look at seven practical lessons in personal ministry that we can glean from Jesus, who was the great evangelist. The first is this. Don't avoid people from other backgrounds. Don't avoid people from other backgrounds. Verse 4 says that Jesus had to pass through Samaria. Why did he have to pass through Samaria? Was it because it was the only way to get where he was going? No. There were three routes to where he was going. And in fact, most Jews would take one of the other two routes because they wanted to bypass Samaria. They hated the Samaritans. The Samaritans hated them. Who wants trouble? And the Jews thought that they would be defiled by passing through Samaria. So this was actually the non-preferred route. So why does it say he had to go through Samaria. John here uses the Greek word day, had to, to say that Jesus had to. And we've seen this word before. It was in chapter 3, verse 4, when it says you have to or you must be born again. Chapter 3, verse 14, when it says the Son of Man must be lifted up. Chapter 9, verse 4. Chapter 10, verse 16. Chapter 12, verse 34. And chapter 20, verse 9. All use this same word to refer to things that had to happen in order for Jesus to fulfill his messianic mission. In other words, these were things in the sovereign, decretive will of God that must take place in the role and mission of Christ as Messiah. Jesus had to go through Samaria because he had a divine appointment with a social outcast, the Samaritan woman. He was submitting to the will of the Father and going where the Father directed him to go. So let me ask you this. Do we go where God tells us to go when he tells us to go into all the world and preach the gospel? To go to all people, all tribes, tongues, and nations and declare the good news. How many ministry opportunities do we as a church and do we individually miss because we're unwilling to go to areas and places and to peoples who are different than us? The first lesson we learn from Jesus, the great evangelist, is that he went to Samaria when the practice of most people was to avoid it. One of the people I admire most is my wife Katie's uncle. His name is Uncle Bob. He served for decades faithfully as a local church pastor and then was very involved in leading missions efforts. And then he retired. So what did he do with his retirement? Did he move into a nice retirement community and whittle away his years playing golf, fishing, relaxing? No, he and his wife moved to one of the hardest, most crime-ridden, poorest neighborhoods in Atlanta and are living among people who are radically different than them. 
There's not a single person in that neighborhood that looks like them. There's not a single person in that neighborhood that has their background. They are ministering to people who are absolutely different than them. And they love those people and those people have grown to love them. They walk around that neighborhood and the people greet him. Hi, Pastor Bob. He stops, he prays with them. He ministers to them. He shares the gospel with them. And God has given him great fruit of lives transformed and changed by the gospel. When we went to visit him, we were sitting there having a conversation and gunshots rang out very nearby. And Uncle Bob just very calmly said, let's move our conversation to the kitchen. He was so calm about it, I kind of asked him about it. He says, well, it happens every night. And so, you know, just when it starts, we go to the kitchen and wait till it's end. And when it's over, we go back to the living room where it's more comfortable. He went to people in a place which was different than him, propelled by the love of Christ for those dear souls. Will we do the same? There are people and places all around us in Kalamazoo that need Christ. Will we avoid them or go to them? There's a second lesson we can learn from his example of witnessing, which is treat everyone with respect because they're made in the image of God. He treated this Samaritan woman with great respect. Verse 6 says that all this took place the sixth hour, which is midday. And so it makes us realize something's kind of different about this Samaritan woman. Because in the heat of the day in the Middle East, you don't go to draw water. Women would travel together for safety in the cool of the evening to draw water. So why is this woman coming by herself in the heat of the midday to draw water. It's because she was a social outcast, shunned by others. She couldn't go with the other ladies because they didn't consider her a lady. She was probably considered a home wrecker, having had five different men and one of whom that she's currently having relations with is not her husband. She's a social outcast, scorned and shunned by the other women. She comes midday, here's Jesus, and he treats her with the respect and the love that she didn't receive even from her own people. So she's shocked that he's there, shocked that he talks to her, and really shocked that he asks her for a drink. Why? Because when it says that Jews have no dealings or do not associate with Samaritans, the verb there, which was commonly used in that day, meant to not share a utensil or not share a dish with. In other words, look, if I share the same cup as you, that would make me as dirty as you. And so when Jesus comes and says, give me a drink, he's saying, I am willing to share a drinking cup with you. I respect you. You're important to me. I don't consider you an outcast. I don't consider you unclean or untouchable. I consider you to be someone made in the image of God, but someone who has fallen into sin and needs repentance. We need to treat everyone with respect because they're made in the image of God. Are they fallen? Yes. Are they sinners? Yes. But they are made in God's image. So we respect them and we treat them with dignity. A third thing we can learn from Christ's example is he used a hinge to transition from the physical to the spiritual. He starts the conversation by asking her for water, and then he says, and by the way, I can give you living water. He uses water as a hinge to transition from the physical to the spiritual. And with practice, you can transition any conversation on any topic to the spiritual. Because all of life belongs to God. He's the creator of all things. There is not a single object or person or activity that should not have God central in it. You're talking about music. Who made man with the ability to create beauty? God did. There is a hinge in every conversation. Learn to use them. Look what the Samaritan woman does. She, when he starts talking about living water, she tries to talk again about physical water. She tries to kind of dodge the issue. And so the fourth thing we see Jesus is doing is he redirects when she tries to dodge. She tries to turn the hinge back to the physical and he swings on that hinge right back to the spiritual. 
You need to learn to do this. The Samaritan woman actually tries to move the focus of the conversation onto the controversy between Samaritans and Jews three times. Three times she tries to make that the focus of the conversation. And each time Jesus redirects her to the vertical. She wants to talk about the horizontal. Who's right, this group of people or this group of people? Jesus says, no, that's not the issue. Who's right? The issue is the creator and you, his creation. The sinner before a holy God who needs salvation. When you witness to people, I guarantee you, they will try to shift the conversation from the vertical, their heart before God, to the horizontal. Which group of people is right in this or that controversy? You need to redirect them to the vertical. No one ever gets saved by arguing over politics, economics, or anything else. They get saved when someone takes them vertical. Them as a sinner in need of a savior. Turn the horizontal to the vertical. Redirect when they try to dodge. Fifth, call their conscience as your primary witness. Call their conscience as your primary witness. She's still kind of trying to redirect towards physical things, and now Jesus, he's going to cut to the heart of the issue for her. He simply says to her, go call your husband and come back. It's actually a pretty striking thing in the conversation. She just said to him, sir, give me this water so I will not be thirsty nor come all the way here to draw. She's now saying, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in this living water. What, what needs to happen? What needs to happen? And he says, go call your husband. Then come back and I'll tell you. Oh, I don't, I don't have a husband. Yeah, you, you've spoken rightly. You don't have a husband. You've had five, and the one you have now is not your husband. He strikes right to the issue of sin. He calls her conscience into play. This is what we need to do when we witness. Every time you talk to someone about sin and salvation, their conscience is already testifying to them about the first half of the conversation. They have a conscience which torments them day and night, the most common feeling of human beings that all human beings share is that of guilt. Why? Because Romans 2 says God has written his law on the heart and he has given us a conscience which either accuses us or acquits us when we do right or wrong. So when you bring the message that we are sinners but there's a savior, their conscience is the primary witness you should call to the truth of that first point that they're a sinner. And trust me, no one wants water until they're thirsty. No one wants a savior until they realize they're a sinner. So call the witness. Call their conscience to testify that they are indeed a sinner. And when their conscience is activated by the grace of God, they become ready to yearn for salvation. Sinners need saving. People who aren't sinners don't need saving. So call their conscience. A sixth thing we can learn from Jesus is answer honest questions and objections. She then brings, I, I really believe, a very sincere question. She's perplexed about our fathers worship in this mountain. You people say that Jerusalem is a place where men ought to worship, right? I really do want to worship the right way. What's the right way? You're a prophet. I see you're a prophet, so maybe you can answer this question for me. And Jesus does answer it, not in the way she expected, but he answers an honest question and objection. He corrects her false doctrine along the way and gives her the answer. Seventh thing that Jesus does is he ends the conversation with the main point. I who speak to you am he. Keep the focus on Jesus. They're going to try to divert the conversation to anything except him. Religious controversies, Questions about this, questions about that, objections to this, objections to that. But the one thing they don't want to talk about is Jesus because he is the only one to whom there's no objection. There's no objection to him. It is he who is the Son of God, the Savior. 
He alone can quench our spiritual thirst and give us eternal life. He alone can forgive sins. He alone is Messiah, the Savior of the world. He alone is perfect in all of his attributes. So keep the focus not on yourself, not on the person, but on Christ. Paul said, look, I resolved to know nothing among you except for Christ and him crucified. 1 Corinthians 1.23 says simply, we preach, what do we preach? We pre- preach Christ crucified. Keep the main one, the main thing. Well, we've seen seven theological truths and seven lessons, practical lessons in ministry from the great theologian and the great evangelist. Let's ask the Lord to help us now to live it. Lord, you are the perfect theologian, the one who reveals the truth to us. You are the way, and you are the truth, and you are the life. So we come to you to learn our doctrine, our worldview, our convictions from you. And Lord, you are the great evangelist. You are the one who is the good news, who brought the good news, and who sends us out to declare the good news. Help us to do it the way that you did it. Help us to follow your example so that we could speak the truth in love. Lord, guard us from the false dichotomy that says we must choose between love and truth. Help us, Lord, as you did, to speak the truth in love. Help us to be in the world, but never of it, so that we could declare your light to the lost, to the hurting, to those like the Samaritan woman who walked away that day, a changed life and a changed eternity. Use us in that way, we pray, for your glory.